Yeah, because I'm going to have like the clicker and then my notes and all that. That would be good. Yeah. That would be good. There was one that I really that I needed like really bad, and I was like, "Man, God is good," you know. Oh yeah, He does. That's why I'm like in the victory. Yeah. Uh, hello, hello, hello. Okay. This is gonna force me to stand still, huh? All right. Yeah, I'll pop it out if I really need to. All right, two minutes. Two minutes. No, you don't want to show the taskbar. Is going to be it here? Okay. One minute. Thirty seconds. Let's uh, go ahead and uh, start with a word of prayer and invite the Holy Spirit's presence to be here. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We want to thank you for this Sabbath. We want to thank you for all that you do in our lives. I just want to pray in a special way for this little seminar that we're having that it will help to improve our outreach our skills and uh, reaching those that need to hear the gospel. We know time is short, so help us to do our part in reaching those that really need to hear your message. Thank you for this time. Please anoint me with your Holy Spirit. Please anoint my lips to speak your words, not mine. And please bless everybody that took the time out of the day to be here the seminar. We thank you. We praise you. Amen. All right, so I, I hope everybody's excited because we are living in the last days. Amen. Do you guys agree with that? The signs are here. So I'm going to read a quick verse to you. It's in Matthew 24 and it's found in verse 14. It says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations and then 
the end will come. So this is a very important scripture for us because we're talking about sharing our faith with other people. And that is spreading the gospel message so that the end will come. Amen? Amen. I have one thing to share from uh, Sister White as well. It says, The world is perishing for once of the gospel. There is a famine for the word of God. There are few who preach the word unmixed with human tradition. Though men have the Bible in their hands, they do not receive the blessing that God has placed in it for them. The Lord calls upon his servants to carry his message to the people. The Lord desires that his word of grace shall be brought home to every soul. To a great degree, there must be accomplished by personal labor. This was Christ's, Christ's method. His work was largely made up of personal interviews. He had a faithful regard for the one soul audience. Through that one soul, the message was often extended to thousands. We are not to wait for souls to come to us. We must seek them out where they are. When the word has been preached in the pulpit, the work has just begun. There are multitudes who will never be reached by the gospel unless it is carried to them. Amen? So we're going to see in this presentation today that everybody who's born in the kingdom of God is a missionary. When you look in the mirror, you are a missionary. God is calling each and every one of us to share our faith and share what Jesus has done for us. So we're going to be talking about uh, personal preparation today, preparing ourselves to go out and uh, reach other people. All right. Solitude. How many of you get up real early in the morning every day to spend a thoughtful hour in prayer, to spend time in devotions in the Bible? Show of hands. Well, at least getting up early and spending that time with Jesus, amen. So solitude is very important. So we're going to look at some scriptures to talk about solitude, having that personal time with Jesus to get us prepared to deal with uh, what's going on in the world, our daily lives, what happens at work, what happens with our friends, our coworkers, etc. So we find in Exodus chapter 34, verses 2 to 4, it says, So be ready in the morning and come up in the mountain to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with you and let no man be seen throughout all the mountain. Let neither flocks nor herds feed before that mountain. So he cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. Then Moses rose up early in the morning and went up Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. You notice Moses was commanded to go up the mountain by himself. That no man was to be with him. Amen. So we need to find a, a place of, uh, I know for me sometimes it's the bathroom because of the kids. We need to find our solitary place uh, where, where we can have our mountaintop experience with God. Proverbs chapter 18, 8, verses 17 says, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Amen? So God loves those that seek him early in the morning. So this is important for us to get up early every day and then have that moment with God. No one can have a relationship with God for you. And God is calling you up the, out, the mountain. Amen? Other people's uh, religions can't save us. Our friends can't save us. Our, you know, our, co our co-workers, neighbors, they can't save us. Only God can save us. Jesus, when preparing for some great trial or some important work, would resort to the solitude of the mountains and spend the night in prayer to his Father. A night of prayer preceded the ordination of the apostles and the Sermon on the Mount the transfiguration, the agony of the judgment hall, and the cross, and the resurrection glory. So Christ would spend all night in prayer so that he could deal with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the other people that he dealt with on a daily basis. We too must have time set apart for meditation and prayer and for receiving spiritual refreshing. 
We do not value the power and efficacy of prayer as we should. That's Ministry Healing 509. So she's saying that we don't observe prayer the way we should because there's much power in prayer. We can have a lot of things done if we would just spend that time in prayer. Amen? We just had a whole sermon on that, that sweet hour of prayer. It reminded me of how much more I needed to be in prayer and how much more we can accomplish if we're surrendered to God and we come to him in humble prayer. Amen? Amen. Morning manna. The early morning often found him in some secluded place, meditating, searching the scriptures, or in prayer. With the voice of singing, he welcomed the morning light. With songs of thanksgiving, he cheered his hours and brought heaven's gladness to the toil-worn and disheartened. If you remember back in the time of Exodus, in the time when uh, Moses brought the children of Israel um, out of Egypt, God started writing manna down from heaven because they were hungry, right? But when did they have to get the manna gathered by? Before the day grew too long, right? Because the manna would melt away. So it's important that we get that morning manna because the Bible is referred to as the bread of life, right? And that we need to read our Bible every day. And so if we don't get that morning manna in before the day gets distracted and distracting, then we might miss that morning manna. Amen? People in the Bible, God called up the mountain. So we'll look at a few people that were called up the mountain. Uh, number one, Moses went up the mountain and saw God's glory. Notice he had to go up the mountain to see God's glory. How would you feel if you were Moses? Would you be excited to go meet with God? Okay. <laughs> Abraham went up the mountain and had an experience with Jesus. Not only did he have that experience with Jesus, but he saw the entire plan of salvation right in front of him. Amen? Notice he got called up the mountain to have that experience. Elijah went up the mountain and called God's people to repentance. God called him where? Up the mountain. Elijah experienced power of prayer and solitude on the mountaintop. Amen? Don't you want to have an experience like Elijah? Okay, amen. How about Enoch? Time with God on the mount prepared and strengthened Enoch for a time of service in the valley. And you realize most of these people really didn't feel like they were, were called by God. They didn't feel like they were talented enough to serve God. But when they went, Moses, right, uh, Exodus chapter 4, he said, Who made man's mouth? Go, and I will give you the words to speak. Amen? Amen? Amen. So we can have the same confidence that Moses and Enoch and Elijah and all of these before us had. How about Peter, James, and John when they had the, the experience of the mount? They were up on the mountain. They had the transfiguration. Amen? How would you have felt at that time? Excited, right? And he said, don't even say anything yet. Right? How do you not say anything? Yes. Huh? You have, to, you have to find and make your own mountaintop experience. That's why I said in the beginning, like when I was in L.A., my wife and I, we were living in, um, it was an extended stay hotel, and my refuge was in the bathroom. I literally locked the bathroom door. I prayed in there, I read my Bible, I'd spend hours in the bathroom. No, but it, you need to have that, it's all about having that solitude, that time away from everything where you can shut it, the world out and listen to that still small voice from God, amen? Okay. So the disciples went up the mountain to have an experience that they could later use to help others. God gives us mountaintop experiences for the same reason, amen? We have a mountaintop experience with God, we get excited, and then we're supposed to take that excitement and take it to the world, what God has done for us. Amen? Amen. Okay. So I'm going to open up to Revelation chapter 14, verses 1. This is speaking of the 144,000. And 
it says here, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father, father's name written in their foreheads. So notice, where are they? They're at the mountaintop, right? And they're being sealed by God, amen? So we need to have that mountaintop experience to be um, imbued with the Holy Spirit, as 144,000 will be. All right, what's at the top of the mountain? God, right? <laughs> Amen? The top of the mountain is where God is found. You may not have a mountain to climb around here, but you need to find somewhere you can be alone with God. Where was Christ crucified? On a mountain, right? Golgotha. So let me suggest we are to crucify self every day on the mountain top at the foot of the cross. Amen? Amen. So what is the spiritual meaning of going up the mountain? How will we victoriously reach the top? Can you say to go up the mountain takes strength, endurance, and a victory? Amen? So that's why we have this mountain time experience, because we need to get to God, because we need to have endurance, we need to have strength, and we need to have the victory. Amen? Amen. All right. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Now we're going to talk a little bit about prayer and how important prayer is, um, as well as the mountaintop experience. Nothing is apparently more helpless yet really more invincible than the soul that fills its nothingness and relies wholly on the merits of the, uh, of the Savior. God would send every angel in heaven to the aid of such a, a one rather than allow him to be overcome. So the weakest Christian, a person who just comes in the church, is just converted, is not very strong, has no endurance, God will send every angel to that person's aid that humbly submits themselves to God. Amen? Amen. God answers prayer, amen? This is 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14 to 15. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and churn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now mine eyes shall be opened and my, mine ears attent unto the prayer that is made in this place. Amen? So a churning away from our wickedness, God will hear our prayers. And that's why it's so important to crucify self um, at the cross on the mountaintop every single day. So genuine prayer is holding nothing back. Amen? Giving all to the Lord. He gave all to us. It says, the prayer that does not succeed in modulating our wishes, in changing the passion of desire into still submission, the anxious tumultuous expectation into quiet surrender is not true prayer. So holding nothing back, letting all of yourself go. Once again, crucifying self. Oh, I was on the wrong slide, sorry. Okay, this one is, this, the life is most holy in which there is at least, is least of petition and desire, most of waiting on God, that in which Petition often passes into thanksgiving. Prayer until prayer makes you forget your own wishes and leaves or merges it into God's will. Amen? Sorry, that's, I had two slides, and it's not on that one, so please forgive me on that. Now, we're going to be talking about the Great Commission. Okay. The Greatest Commission. Amen? And so, if you have your Bibles, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 28. And we're going to look at verses 18 to 20. It 
It says here, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy, Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen? So Christ, the, his departing words to his disciples was, to Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptize them, right? Teaching them all things. His promise to us, though, as we're out there and doing these things, he says, And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen? That's powerful. So Jesus is with, with us at all times. So this is the greatest commission is to go out and spread the gospel. All right, Romans 10, 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Do you see what's happening here? How can they follow something they haven't heard about? Right? The good news of the gospel. He's calling us to go and share what we believe. And how shall they hear without a preacher? Amen? You guys know who this guy is here? You might know who this is, John Paul. This gentleman, uh, this is Scott O'Grady, and he was basically shot down. And when he was shot down, uh, the enemy was looking for him, and he hid under mud, and he was drinking water out of his clothes, and he was eating ants to survive. Bosnia, June 8, 1995, Scott O'Grady had waited six days he had been praying and waiting for rescue. His F-16 was shot down, hit on its underpass and blind spot. In 20 seconds, he ejected. When he landed, the enemy went to capture him. In minutes, Serbians surrounded him, but they could not find him. He put his face in the dirt. He ate ants and grass. He drank water from his drenched socks. Special forces were dispatched with a naval fleet of 40 planes. The whole shooting match was garnered for one soldier. So God is calling us all. He says, we are called to go teach all nations whatsoever Christ has commanded. And we're going to see that that story of that pilot, that God has an army of angels ready to save the one lost person. Amen? Amen. So our business is to help those in need, right? This other picture, not our business. Amen? <laughs> Hopefully we don't sleep in church, right? Okay. Okay. People who have been convicted by the Holy Spirit will desire to commit their lives to Christ through baptism. Amen? So here's the thing, if we're just out sharing the gospel with those that are lost, if we're just doing the best that we can, Christ is going to send all the angels to our aid to help us to reach those that are lost. Amen? And as we're friending these people and we're showing that we care about them, they're going to make those decisions for Christ. Amen? When I'm out there, it's nothing that I'm doing. I'm out just sharing the gospel, and then people are making their own decisions based on what God's doing in their lives. Amen? We are to go forth relying fully on God to lead others into a saving relationship with our Savior. This is Desire of Ages, page 195. 
says, every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. So in other words, every person that is called by God is a missionary. When you look in the mirror, you are a missionary, whether it be in your home, whether it be in your city, whether it be at your work, whether you're in a third world country, we are missionaries according to God. Amen? Amen. If a commission by an earthly king is considered an honor, how can a commission by a heavenly king be considered a sacrifice? David Livingston. If the whole support system was put together for just one who pleaded, help, I am alive, send help, then the great God of heaven is also preparing a team for the rescue. Amen? There was one lost. Christ came and searched. He did not give up easily. He forgot all about himself and went searching inside enemy territory. He came at great expense. Jesus did not ask, why did the sheep leave? What happened? Instead, he found it and placed it on his shoulder. When Captain O'Grady was rescued, the whole nation rejoiced. How much will God rejoice over the one you saved this year? So here's a very import, important point. A lot of people, you know, you, call, you hire the Bible worker, he comes in, he does the work. Or she, right? If you were to focus on one soul a year, Everybody is capable of bringing one person to Christ every year. Amen? Think about if every person focused on one person to be a friend with for an entire year, 365 days. Did you know our church would double by next year? And then the year after that, it would triple and then quadruple because the people you bring in are going to be excited about our message and they're going to go out and bring more people in. But all we have to do is focus on one person a year. Amen? Amen. Evangelism 333 says, There is no greater bliss on this side of heaven than in winning souls to Christ. What keeps my Christian experience going is when I'm out there and I'm sharing this truth that has been revealed to me, and I watch people's faces light up. I watch people's lives change because of this important information. We deal with a lot of different denominations. And it's really awesome when you see people who have been studying for 40 years that get gets the Adventist message and they say, wow, that is really amazing. I've never seen that before. And so each of us can have that joy of, you know, watching people get baptized, watching people accept the truth that we have. It's, it's really awesome. And just like this says, there is no greater bliss on this side of heaven than in winning souls to Christ. Amen? Why me? Romans 10, 14. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So this is, this is why it's so important for us to always be sharing our faith no matter what. Amen? Romans 10.15 tells us, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Amen? So we have beautiful feet, right, if we go and bring the gospel to others. We receive a blessing from being Christ's hands and feet. This is Christ's Object Lessons, page 354. He who begins with a little knowledge in a humble way and tells what he knows while seeking diligently for further knowledge, will find the whole heavenly treasure awaiting his demand. The more he seeks to impart light, the more light he will receive. Amen? So when I first, when I was, when I first came to Christ, and uh, I didn't really know how to explain the Bible, I didn't really know how to uh, share what I knew, but I knew that God had saved me, that Christ had saved me from myself. 
And, and I went out and I just started sharing with everybody who, about Jesus, everybody who came across my path back in the little town of Oakhurst where my wife and I are from. And I was noticing, I would say things that I was like, where is that coming from? Where, where is that information coming from? As I prayed and I did this more and more and more, I was understanding the Bible more and I was able to share more and more and more. And I realized that the Holy Spirit was coming into my life and sharing the information that I had read in the Bible. He says, I will bring all things to your remembrance and whatsoever you have, whatever God has told us. Amen? Amen. So the more we impart this little bit of knowledge, the more is given to us. It says the whole treasure house is there for us. The more one tries to explain the word of God to others with a love for souls, the plainer it become, becomes to himself. The more we use our knowledge and exercise our power, the more knowledge and power we shall have. Amen? Doesn't that sound good? Amen. Now, we're going to get into uh, friendship evangelism. It is through personal contact and association that men are reached by the saving power of the gospel. They are not saved in masses, but as what? Individually. A lot of people won't even step foot into a church. A lot of times we wait for them to come in. That happens every now and then, but the real success is going out and finding those um, that really need the gospel that won't be saved in masses. They are not saved in masses, but as individuals. This is Ministry of Healing. This talks about Christ's method alone. Page 143. Christ, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, won their confidence, then he bade them follow me. Do you see all these steps here of bringing people to the gospel? Christ's method. That's Ministry Healing, page 143. Please go home and look at this, memorize it, and then put it into practice. Amen? Yes, sir. Um, there's a black tablet. Anybody seen a black tablet? Okay. All right, building friendships. So there's some key points to building our friendships. Number one, never argue. <laughs> Amen? Agree where possible. Be careful of lengthy discourses. This is the reason why, is we have an enemy called Satan that likes to feed the fire. And uh, what's interesting, when I go door to door a lot of times, I know right when I'm about to get a, a new Bible study is a person that I get at the door wants to talk and talk and talk about all this stuff that has nothing to do with the Bible. So we got to be careful of lengthy di discourses. And once again, we always need to be lifting Christ up in everything that we say, we do, right? Amen? Because Christ says, if you lift me up, I will draw all men unto myself. So we have the power of Christ. As long as we lift him up in all of our conversation, we can actually get away from lengthy discourses and we can actually get the focus on Jesus. Amen? And only friends can be friends to Jesus. Amen? Okay. So we want people to feel welcomed to speak with us and comfortable. We don't want them to feel that they have to put their guard up when speaking on a deep biblical topic. And so we need to agree wherever possible. Things like, we know what happens when we die, the state of the dead, but I can't wait to see my grandmother in heaven. Or, yes, I'm looking forward to seeing my grandmother or my mom or, you know, son or whatever in heaven. So agree with them because that can be a real touchy subject for a lot of people. So we're going to look at our circle of influence. There's the Desire of Ages 141. John the Baptist, he directed two of his disciples to, where, where did he direct them to? To Christ. Then one of these, Andrew, found his brother and called him to, called him to the Savior. 
Philip was then called and he went in search of Nathaniel. These examples should teach us the importance of personal effort of making direct appeals to our kindred, friends, and neighbors. Amen? Michael, can I use you as an example real quick? Can I use you as an, as an example real quick? So last week, Michael came up to my car window. He asked me a question. I gave him my, I have ministry cards. I gave him a ministry card. I gave him uh, Steps to Christ. I gave him a glow track. I told him that, you know, I do Bible studies. He came back about five minutes later and said, hey, let me give you my address because I'd like to do Bible studies. Amen. And he got a Bible, too. He came back, needed a Bible, and we've been doing Bible studies. Amen. And now he's here in our church. Amen. Amen. Leanne. That's a great example. I knocked on her door. So here's the thing. Always share your faith no matter what, because you never know who the person is that's ready for a Bible study, that wants to know God. Amen. Amen. Another example, if uh, this gentleman, he may end up being here very shortly. Uh, I'm at the gym all the time, and so I let people know, you know, um, I'm in ministry, this is what I do full time. I teach the Bible, prophecies of Daniel, Revelation. And I was in the steam room, steam room one day. There was about three people in there. I hang out at the steam room a lot. <laughs> a couple guys left, and there was one gentleman left, and he said, I know you're in ministry, and I know you had a really messed up life, and I know if God can save you, he can save me as well. I just want to know God. Can you teach me to know God? And so I have Bible studies with this guy. So it's just being a light and being an example for Christ at all times. And so when you do that and you point people to Christ, there's a power that comes with that. Amen? And then they go tell people, and they go tell people as they're, because most people I talk to, within a couple weeks, they're sh already sharing the information with their friends or roommates or whatever it is, because they're like, wow, this stuff is real. Amen? Amen. So our sphere of influence, we have family, we have friends, we have neighbors, and we have coworkers. Do we all have those, every one of us? Amen? Do we all have friends and coworkers and neighbors and family? Yeah. Amen. Unity through these things, right? Amen. So not everybody has time to go stand in the marketplace or go knocking on doors, but we definitely have a sphere of influence of people that we can reach in our daily lives. Amen. People that we can impact and make an exam and, and be an example to. Amen. Okay. So let this not be your motto here. Sweet box, my safe box, nothing can harm me in my little box, right? Christ has called us to be in the world, not of the world, right? To go into the world, not to, you know, I've heard, you know, we've had Adventist sects where they go up because of the GMOs and they stay up there and they don't even want to get involved with anything. They have their own community, but that's not what God called us to do. He called us to be in the, uh, in, in the world. Okay. Now we're going to talk about starting a conversation. Make sure if you're writing down notes, make sure you write these notes down because this is called the Fort Method. Fort. Okay, there it is. Fort Method. All right. So number one, F represents family. All right, these are some of the questions we can ask. How is your family? Or do you have family? Do you have children? Are you married? How long have you lived in, you know, Gurney or Waukegan? Where were you raised? Some basic ice-breaking questions because a lot of times when you think of evangelism, you think of some guy standing on the street corner with a loudspeaker talking about repent or you're going to go to hell, right? Well, friendship evangelism is much different than that. You're actually in a very short period. You have about three minutes with people usually, sometimes only a minute. And you want to be able to break the ice. So, hey, you know, do you have family, et cetera, et cetera. Um, next is occupation. What do you do for work? How long have you worked at your job? Do you enjoy your job? And if they look like they're, they're retired, you ask them, you know, are you retired? What do you do in your retirement? Amen? Real basic questions. Four methods. Family, occupation. Next will be religion. If I'm going too fast, let me slow down. Okay. Slow down. I can go back. Did you get that? Okay. Sorry. 
Did you get the, the, the family? Okay. Occupation? Yeah. Just basic stuff, just how to start up a conversation with random people that you run into. You know, hey, you know, do you have family? Are you, are you a husband? You know, do you have a wife? Do you have kids? You know, how long have you been married, et cetera? Do you live in the area? How long have you lived here? Have you always lived here? Just basic questions. And then you get, you, you, you show that you're interested in who they are. Not just, hey, hey, do you know Jesus? Okay, well, I can't talk to you then, right? Okay. And then uh, religion. Religious background, you know, what denomination are you? How long have you been um, in that denomination? Have you been there all your life? Do you attend church? And if you attend church, what church do you go to? And does your whole family attend that church? So now you're getting on the topic of religion. You can figure out where they are with God, you know, because today we live in a day where there's a lot of atheists. There's a lot of people who believe in the Eastern religions and spiritualism. You know, say, I'm spiritual, but I don't go to church. You know, you get a lot of these different answers. So you can kind of see what you're working with, where they're at in their walk with God. All right. And testimony. So I would go home and practice your personal testimony because what happens a lot of the times is when you think of your personal testimony, a lot of us have lived quite a bit. And you want to write down all these details of your testimony. You want to be able to break down your testimony into three minutes. I, I'm sure most of you don't take the bus, but if you take the bus, you have a very short period of time. Like say you're standing out and you're waiting to get on the bus or you're in the uh, supermarket in, in the grocery line and you've got a very short period of time to talk to people and tell them your testimony. So you want to keep it real simple. Three parts, one minute apiece, and you have life before Christ how you became a Christian, and how you're, what's that? Yeah, Jesus is coming. Amen. Amen. And so, and then your life after Christ. Amen? What your life is like right now with Christ, what he's done for us. Just in a real simple three minutes, you could take that home and, uh, you know, practice. You know, I, I know when I was in Amazing Facts, we would stand up and, you know, give each other our personal testimonies our canvases, stuff like that, uh, as we were going to go and talk to people. All right, and usually we would practice, but we're not going to do that today. So just practice at home, practice with your, we don't have enough people to practice anyway. So did you guys get that though? Life before Christ, how you came to Christ, and what your life is after Christ or now. What's that? No, no, but I'm saying if if you if you want to practice, you guys want to practice? Okay. All right, so we're going to take uh, 10 minutes then, and you're going to write down your personal testimony, figure out how to do it in three minutes, and then we'll go ahead and practice. Thank you, Leanne. Amen. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> Amen. Okay. guys up and running good okay all right so so secret to success at someone's door is to observe now like I said not everybody is going to be going door to door but I remember uh, once again when I first converted uh, I, I watched a lot of David Ashtrick and when he told me that, what he was saying, when you look in the mirror, you're a missionary. And I got so excited that I just went to all my neighbor's houses and just started knocking on their doors and said, hey, you want to do a Bible study? So, I mean, you can just try it out. It's fun. It's different. Um, you know, you're, you have new neighbors or whatever, bake a cake, bake something, take some goodies and let them know, hey, you know, I live here. And then start that, yeah, Panera Bread, whatever you have to do. Whatever you have to do. I mean, we live, literally, we live in the last days. And so whatever we have to do to bring the gospel today. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the four C's, which is called building bridges. The four C's is what we believe in, a real simplified version of that. So, I believe in Christ. When they say, what do, what do you believe? What do I believe? I believe in Jesus, um, that he's the divine son of God. That's 1 John 5.20. 
is God in the human flesh. John chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, and verse 14. For God is eternal. Christ, holy God and man, Hebrews 2, 12 to 14 and 16. And that Jesus Christ is creator, that is before all things and in him all things consist. Amen. Real basic. I believe in Jesus Christ. I also believe in the cross. I believe that Jesus died for our sins, that through the cross we have redemption. Yes. Okay, sorry. I'll slow it down. Yes. I'm actually tired today, too. All right, so believe in the cross, that Jesus died for our sins, that's 2 Corinthians 5.19, that we receive redemption through his blood, through the cross, Romans 3.24, 2 Corinthians 5.21, and they were saved by his grace, amen? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. And we believe in his commandments, amen? The Ten Commandments. The reason why we believe in his commandments, uh, partially because he told us, if you love me, keep my commandments, but we obey out of love, amen? A lot of people think of the commandments as legalism, but we, we're obedient because we love God. Works do not save us. Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 9. Commandments are a sign of our faith, James 2, 18. And it's a choice and guide of life. Proverbs 29, 18. Amen? All right, and then best yet, we believe Jesus Christ is coming again. Amen? <laughs> yes, Paul. Oh, you're just excited. Okay, that's good. <laughs> All right, so we believe Jesus Christ's coming is near. Amen? Luke 21, 28, Matthew 24. We have confirmation in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelations. Amen? And then we have the reason for our titles as Adventists. Amen? Uh, for our title, the Adventists, what Advent means. First Advent, Christ came as a baby. The second Advent is when... He returns in his clouds of glory to take us all home. Amen? Amen. So it's important to share your testimony, and this is why. We find it in Desire of Ages. Page 347, it says, that which will be most effectual is the testimony of your own experience. That's the biggest bridge that you have is, like I said, uh, many times I tell people everything I went through before I became a Christian, you know, prison and drugs and all that stuff. And then they think, wow, well, if he was that bad and God can save him, he can do it for me too. So it's really a, a bridge on, you know, to show that we were not always, you know, because a lot of people think that, oh, you're a Christian and that you're perfect automatically. We can show them that we're human and we fall short too. And that if God can save you, he can save uh, them as well. Now, God is asking us not to be what we call a silent witness. You cannot be a silent witness. If you love Jesus, he will profess him boldly. And you will not be ashamed to share Christ and how he saved you. Amen? And the reason for this is if you really love Christ, you can't help but share Christ with everybody and everyone who comes in your path. And notice what Jesus says here. Matthew 10, verse 32 to 33. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. 
So it's very important that we are not silent witnesses, that we are not in our little box, that we're out there sharing Christ. Notice here, Daniel, he was a silent witness. Even though he wasn't supposed to pray, he still prayed. He still was a witness to God, amen? And every time he was a witness to God and something crazy happened, he got promoted, amen? All right. Here's Desire of Ages, page 347. Every individual has a life distinct from all others and an experience differing essentially from theirs. God desires that our praise shall ascend to him, marked by our own individuality. These precious acknowledgments to the praise of the glory of his grace, when supported by a Christ-like life, have an irresistible power that works for the salvation of souls. Amen? We all have our own personal story that will affect somebody else's life. Once again, whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Sire of Ages, page 340. As witnesses for Christ, we are to tell what we know, what we ourselves have seen and heard and felt. We can tell how we have tested his promise and found the promise true. We can bear witness to what we have known of the grace of Christ. This is the witness for which our Lord calls and for want of which the world is perishing. Great example. Um, I talk to people all the time. They say, where's the miracles? There's no miracles. There's nothing happening. Where's this Jesus you're talking about? And I tell them, the supernatural power of the, th the way God has changed my life, that's all the miracle I need. And therefore, you can be a witness as to how God has radically transformed your life. You can give them examples where you tried on your own without God. But when you really came to God, then the change really happened. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we need to look for divine appointment. Use me. I say every person that comes across your path is a divine appointment. Do you believe that? It's true. So think about ministries you can do, whether it's for the church or some kind of outreach, but look for ministries that you can do. Those are also divine appointments. And divine appointments, was, which is actually just answering the call. Amen? You are the divine appointment that God is sending out there to uh, use to witness to other people. The Bible is full of divine appointments. What about the book of Esther? She was at the right place, the right time, right? Book of Daniel, right? Many times, right? He was at the right place at the right time. Cer certain circumstances happened to him that he became a witness. He was used as a divine appointment. From captivity to conversion of the king, right? By the end of King Nebuchadnezzar's life, he ended up worshiping the God of heaven, right? Amen. So will we answer his calling to us? I don't know. My slides are a little different here. So God can use you and me answer the call will we answer his calling to us and how do we answer it and what method should we use what method should we use Christ method remember so step out with faith in God and reach people's hearts amen and we're going to look at the, from Ministry of Healing, remember that? Jesus tended to the people's needs. He clothed them, he healed them, he fed them. He won their confidence and he bid them, follow me. So here it is. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. 
the Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them follow me. Amen? Real simple steps. Yeah, and then we use the fort method, and we use the, you know, what you believe in method and your personal testimony. Amen? Christ's method works, does it not? Amen? So it works in reaching friends by listening and paying, at paying attention to them. Invite them to bridge events. Invite them to nature hikes and other outdoor activities and offer them a helping hand around the house. This gets very uncomfortable for people. You know, becoming a Bible worker and ministering to people, I've, I was the most impatient person ever. I was a drug addict. I just wanted things now. But to be able to stop and listen to people and really be there for people, it's, it's changed my life a lot. You know what I mean? And so we can all have that experience. We just need to listen and pay attention. We need to go out of our way even when it feels uncomfortable. Even when our flesh is like, no, I don't really want to do that. As a matter of fact, another example, no, no pat on my back whatsoever, but I got done doing Bible studies all day. I hadn't been home with my wife all day. I got home, and there was a gentleman in the apartment complex, and he had to move out that night. He had nobody to help him, so I said, you know what? I'm going to come help you right now. I didn't want to do it. I'll be honest. I didn't want to do it, but I went ahead. I went in there, and I moved all his furniture. You know, it's all 930 at night, so that's what Christ is calling us to do, to, to, be, to go that extra mile for people. And when you do that, you open up that door to minister them, to them about Jesus, amen, and pray with them and hopefully get Bible studies. <laughs> So two, reaching our neighbors, get introduced to them, bring gifts, cookies, cake, etc. Go door to door just to say hello, invite them for a meal after Sabbath perhaps, mingle and be social and become friends and invite them to services. Amen? Amen. Am I going too fast? Okay. We're almost done for today. Reaching anybody. The sky is the limit. Get creative. Each person is different. Be friendly and don't forget to smile. <laughs> Remember this verse. This verse was the very first verse that I had to memorize when I went to Amazing Facts. It's Galatians 6, 9. Let us not be weary for in well-doing, or grow weary for in well-doing, we shall reap if we faint not. Amen? Amen. Oh, there it is. There it is. Yep, Galatians 6, 9. Yep, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not, meaning do not give up. Bless you. Okay. What's the best ministry? Live the life that Christ commanded us to. Amen? Remain in obedience to God. Constant prayer for divine appointments and God's leading. Another example where I learned that this really worked as I was going to a seminar, it was right before uh, I was baptized into the Adventist faith. Um, I would pray every day, Lord, just lead me to somebody to talk to. And every day I got somebody to talk to. Next thing you know, it was two people and then five people and then 10 people. And then one day my wife came to pick me up in front of uh, Vaughn's and I had a group of like 15 young people that I was just witnessing to about God. And she's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm talking to them about God. So God will answer that call. If you just pray, just give me somebody to, to, to answer, you know, to talk to so that I can uh, share my faith with and you can ask that every day and God will answer he'll give you somebody and it might be in a weird way a way that you don't expect you know you hear uh, at times where pastors if they got a flat tire they got help with their tire it was you know a, a stressful situation they left and they never even talked to the person that could have been a divine appointment and that's why I say every person that comes in your path is a divine appointment whether it's the plumber that comes in your home it's a person that knocks on your door that's trying to sell you uh, you know, dish satellite or AT&T wire, whatever it is, right? That's a divine appointment. That's who we are to talk to. So the question is, will you accept the call? 
Huh? Amen. Here's a reason why. Let me share it with you. Review and Herald, May 22nd, 1888. In the day of God, how many will confront us and say, I am lost, I am lost, and you never warned me. You never entreated me to come to Jesus. Had I believed as you did, I would have followed every judgment-bound soul within my reach with prayers and tears and warnings. In that day of God, how many will confront us? They will say, you never entreated me to come to Jesus. In that day, the master will demand of his professed people, what have you done to save the souls of your neighbors? There were many who were connected with you in worldly business, who lived close beside you, whom you might have warned. Why are they among the unsaved? Notice it says, there were many that were connected with you. Why are they among the the unsaved. Isaiah 43.10 says, You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed nor shall there be after me. Acts of the Apostles, page 564. The Lord would have all his sons and daughters happy, peaceful, and obedient through the exercise of faith. The believer comes into possessions of these blessings. Through faith, every deficiency of character may be supplied. Every defilement cleansed, every fault corrected, every excellence de developed. Amen? So before you go, oh, thank you for coming, but I have a quick video for you. You ready?
All right, let's have a word of prayer. That's it. Thank you guys for coming. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that we've had in this uh, seminar to take uh, a few things and maybe be able to share our faith with others. There are so many people that need to hear the gospel message. Time is running out. It's no different than if uh, Noah's boat was here and the rain was coming down. Things are happening so quickly. And so help us, Lord, help us to be a light in this dark world. Help us and be with us the rest of the Sabbath. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.